All right, uh, well, thank you everybody for coming out. We really appreciate you um, joining us tonight, uh, asking questions and learning a bit about the, uh, the Big Sky Wind Repowering Project. My name's Kevin Wetzel. Um, I'm a developer for the project, so that just means that I kind of try to keep my eye on uh, all the different facets of the project and work with all the different team leaders, whether that's engineering and construction, uh, the land relationship team, uh, the um, finance team and otherwise to just try to uh, move this project forward. Uh, right now we are uh, the team here that's kind of working through the repowering process and figuring out whether this makes sense and, and we can move this forward. Um, we really do think that this is going to be a wonderful project uh, for the community. Uh, just to reiterate some of the high points that I'm sure people have seen on the boards. Uh, we're looking at removing about 17 turbines uh, from the project while maintaining the megawatt capacity of around 240 megawatts and actually increasing the uh, production of clean energy by about 30 percent. Um, the construction time frame, as people have seen, is uh, relatively short, about a nine-month build uh, in 2020. And so what we're, we're really trying to do is maintain as much of the existing infrastructure as possible, the collection system, the substation, the transmission line, to try to have as a low impact on the land and, and the community as possible and try to tighten the construction window. So when we talk about the decommissioning and the um, repowering of turbines, we're really only talking about the uh, blades, the nacelles, and the towers. The foundations will be reused. The, the uh, underground collection, for the most part, will be reused where, uh, where we need to do small upgrades, we will. Um, we're really excited also to, to try to give back to the community as we go through this process. So what you've seen on the boards are a couple of commitments that have already been made by the project, $50,000 to a community benefits program that will be established here in the village of Ohio for different types of programs. Also $10,000 to the Ryan Wetland uh, uh, Prairie uh, area for maintenance and other uh, activities there. So uh, if you've got other ideas for us uh, as we go through the community benefits program, um, please let us know. We would love to get some uh, uh, specific ideas from you all so that we can try to build them into our, our program. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Paul to talk a little bit about the uh, construction procedures and process uh, for the project. We have heard uh, concerns and uh, we just want to make sure that you understand that we recognize those. Uh, we know that we are not the, uh, the first and won't be the last uh, wind project and wind company to, uh, to be here and so we're trying to learn from the past and make sure that we are incorporating all that feedback into how we're going to be uh, moving this project forward. So uh, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes here giving this overview and then we're really excited to do you know, the Q&A. So please, if you have any questions, come up and, uh, and let us know. And we'll do our best to answer them here. If we can't answer them, we will follow up. Uh, we can commit to that. And the other thing I'll just mention is you know, if, if there are kind of really specific questions about maybe an individual turbine or an individual uh, road or something like that, it may be difficult for us to answer them without a map and uh, you know, kind of all the details in front of us. So if that is the case, uh, please, we would love to have one-on-one -on -one meetings, come meet you at your homes or anywhere else to have those more specific conversations. So I'll just apologize in advance if we can't speak to every individual turbine or issue that you might have, but we can commit to following up after this meeting one-on-one -on -one and having all those conversations with you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul just to cover a couple of um, questions that we've gotten pretty uh, frequently around the construction methods. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Paul. I'm with uh, Pattern Development on the uh, ENC side for uh, pre-construction. Um, we've, uh, as Kevin mentioned, that um, you know for the build, a lot of the infrastructure is already in place, so most of the uh, construction is going to be centered around upgrading some of the roads uh, to be able to bring in uh, new components and taking out the old. Um, uh, and we've heard some concerns about um, compaction, decompaction, and drain tiles. So I just want to address some of that right now. Um, the drain tiles. Um, you know, where they can be located. Uh, we're gonna stake and mark them. Um, when it comes to our crane paths, we're gonna have delineated areas that we're, uh, uh, it's gonna be uh, uh, paths that we're gonna be have staked so the tr cranes will only go in through that pathway. Um, and when it comes to a drain tile, if it is able to be marked, we're going to bridge across with our cranes. Um, and if there is damage, of course, we will be responsible. We will repair them. Um, a good portion of the work is going to be mostly crane path work, um, no trenching uh, during the original construction. I'm sure a lot of the trenching of the collection line might have caused a lot of that, da a lot of that damage. So uh, this is mostly going to be a crane. Um, when it comes to the com decompaction portion of it, um, you know, um, we're going to be able to uh, go through and uh, use um, uh, a chisel um, and do the de uh, decompaction portion of the work. 
we're going to have a single point of contact for both. Um, I should have brought this up before. Single point of contact for uh, communications with the land landowners to be able to address drain tiles, and a single point of contact as well for it. And when, at the end of the project, when we are doing the decompaction reclamation work, you'll be able to talk to that individual. And at the end of the project, they'll be able to um, walk with you and approve the site as it's reclaimed. So you guys have an opportunity to approve the work before the contractor leaves the site. So um, with that, um, you know, after this, I will be open for more questions and I'll be available. Um, so I appreciate it. Thank you. So why don't we do quick intros, just so you know who you're talking to up here. Uh, I introduced myself already, Kevin Wetzel, project developer uh, for Pattern Development. Hey, good evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just have to say as an aside, you can tell we're in a school because nobody wanted to sit in the front row. <laughs> but if anybody wants to move up to be able to hear better, please don't be shy. Feel free to come forward. Uh, my name is Deanne Lands, and I'm with Pattern. I'm an employee of Pattern Development. Um, I've actually been doing renewable energy and uh, wind farm. Uh, have overseen about 3,000 megawatts of wind farms. My title is Director of Land, which basically just means that I'm kind of the liaison who interacts with all of the landowners. So, to the extent that anybody ever has questions or concerns. Uh, before construction, during construction, after construction, when you're in operation, I like to kind of be that single point of contact for landowners. And I don't always know the answer to your questions, but I'm the one person that can probably at least find the person who does. So thank you again so much for coming this evening. And we look, we look forward to uh, answering your questions. And Paula, many of you have, may have already met Paula, but Paula works for me. And she is the person who braved the polar vortex over the last few weeks to get out here and meet with many of you. So she's the one that's been in the area um, meeting with lots of landowners and will continue to do so. Thank you. Hi, my name is Natalie McHugh. Um, I'm also employee of Pattern Energy. Um, I am our Director of Environmental and Permitting. So if you have any um, permitting questions, environmental questions related to any you know, species out there or impacts, uh, I'd be more than happy to um, address those for you. So those of you with questions, we'll go ahead and have you start lining up. Linda, you have a question? Yes. Well, I have lots of them, but I'll start with one. And I like this so I don't have to watch it. I know you said you couldn't talk about each individual wind times, but I would like to hear the logic about which wind turbines will be depowered specifically here in Ohio town, but if you could say for each wind turbines, I would also like to know that. So that's a kind of a two pace thing. So just to make sure everybody heard the question, it was, you know, how did we go about um, assessing which wind turbines would be repowered and which uh, would not be? So there's a, a number of criteria that we've been working with over the past uh, six or so months to uh, try to identify which, uh, what the project design is going to look like. And so I'll try to walk through a few of those. Uh, first is um, the county requirements um, around which turbines actually can be repowered based on location. So uh, something that's happened in between when the original project was developed relative to today is that actually Bureau County has updated their uh, wind ordinance. And that means that some of these setback regulations have changed. And for example, um, you know, you need to be a certain uh, distance away from uh, residences. And so any turbine that doesn't meet the minimum distance may need to be removed because it doesn't meet the county requirement to be repowered. Um, so there's a lot of those both in Lee and Bureau County that we were working with to try to figure out, you know, which turbines meet the criteria and which do not. Uh, another is working with local communities. So, uh, for example, meeting with uh, the village and, and the board here in town to find out which turbines, you know, we may have caused, you know, the most problems in the past or that they would like to see us figure out if we might be able to remove. Uh, another is working with the, uh, the Ryan Wetland Group to find out which turbines they have found to be the biggest impact on the species that they care about there in the conservation district. So um, those are a couple of, of examples. The other more technical uh, examples are 
Each set of turbines uh, are part of a collector system, and in order to limit the impacts of uh, needing to redig and replace a lot of the collector system, we have to balance the turbines that be, that are removed versus repowered. So, for example, we can't take all the turbines from one single piece of the project area because those are most likely in a single collection area, and that means that the, the project would be unbalanced uh, for power generation, and we'd have to go and uh, essentially rebuild the entire collection system, which would be much more impactful. On, on the land and impact you know, the duration of construction. So those are some of the examples of, of what we went through during the design, um, what we call optimization process to figure out which turbines would be removed. Um, and also, of course, we, we had considerations with all of our, our landowners and participating um, kind of project uh, participants trying to limit the impacts there. Now, of course, everyone you know, might be aware that we weren't able to, to be perfect in our, our goal to minimize impacts. But uh, what we've tried to do is make a, a nice balance between our landowners, the county requirements, and the technical limitations that we have on the project. Hi, I'm Don Meyer, and I guess I'm speaking as a farmer and concerned about the damage to the farm ground. And I know with the, uh, the schedule you have for the construction, uh, it's December, and that can be a soupy, mucky month. And uh, I guess I'm looking for assurances that everything that we've done to minimize the damage and, and to stay off our farm ground when we can. Uh, deadlines are nice to get projects done, but they also force maybe bad decisions to get equipment out there when it shouldn't. So I guess what I'm looking for is assurances that our farm ground will be protected as much as possible. So the question, if I want to repeat, is um, mainly what are the assurances we can have that uh, will ho hopefully minimize damage to the farmland, and then if there is damage, what are the assurances that will make sure we repair it? I can speak first to the lease, and then I'll turn it over to Paul to talk about kind of construction standards. But um, the leases that the landowners have do have provisions that require that we repair um, any damage that's caused. Uh, there is a separate payment for both crop damages as well as compaction damages, and then there are provisions that provide that in the event of any damage to drainage tiles, we are legally responsible to um, repair those as well. It, maybe the other thing outside of the, the, the leases that the project will be entering into uh, here in the next couple of weeks actually is an uh, agricultural impact maintenance agreement with, uh, with the state uh, agricultural board. So that'll be an agreement that sits on top of the legal obligations that we've already signed up for in the leases that we will be obligated to maintain the quality and repair any damage to, to the, uh, the land in the course of, uh, of construction. That'll be, I believe, a public agreement. Um, but the, the, the AMA, is, we call it an AMA, is a very standard form that the, that the state requires all projects like this to sign, and we will be signing that as well, which is just further assurance that the, um, the mitigations will be put in place. Paul, do you want to talk just about kind of general process? Yeah, um, so again, we'll have a single point of contact there on site that will work with the landowners. Um, and when we do the work, you know, we're going to have uh, disturbance limits that we're going to put on ourselves to be able to work within our areas. So when we do the work, you know, we'll be moving the topsoil aside and then doing um, the necessary work to be able to decommission and re-erect the turbines. And then that uh, single point of contact, again, at the end of the project, we'll make sure that, uh, you know, we have the landowner the ability to be able to sign off and approve the work that's being done um, in, in a condition that's satisfactory. And of course, there is a warranty period as well, and then all the other provisions along with that um, and just speak on the construction side of it. Al, you have a question. I have three. Okay. Um, one is uh, when you put the bigger turbines in, the ice uh, throwing off the blades and um, fire and whatnot, who's responsible for that if something does happen? Like, uh, say a blade comes off and flies over in your property, your barn, your house, or whatever. Who is responsible for that? Does that answer? Uh, so I think the short answer to the, 
the question is that the project has controls in place to make sure that ice throw and things like that are being monitored and taken care of and the, the uh, turbine is being operated in those conditions touched to avoid any sort of safety hazard or ice throw event. Um, but to the extent that anything did happen, the project is, you know, insured for liability for, you know, uh, issues that might occur for things like that. During the construction, the, the gravel roads, and, and we, ha we happen to live on the gravel road, is the gravel roads, and I talked to this gentleman here earlier, Paul, is the gravel roads gonna be like calcium chloride or something to keep the dust down for the construction? Because I was just concerned with the animals and our grandkids out and about for the, the duration of the construction. All I ask, I just want to know is, uh, are they gonna be calcium chloride or whatever you folks do to keep the dust down because that's that's an issue during construction and I know that very well because I haul cranes to the windmills almost every day and that is a big con big concern about a lot of the people and I just want to know if that was going to be addressed so the question was about um, the dirt roads in the condition during construction, uh, making sure that um, you know dust and and um, it's um, properly you know taken care of. So uh, during the construction process, there uh, the, the contractor could could do calcium chloride, um, but most of the time it's um, use water trucks to keep the cut uh, keep the dust down. Um, they have to be monitoring that. It's also part of the road use agreement that uh, we will be uh, signed up with with the counties and townships. As well as that, uh, there are uh, speed restrictions um, that the, the, the um, trucks and the equipment has to uh, abide by. So that'll also help keep the keep the dirt down, but also just overall safety. And we'll be monitoring that um, on the side as well. It's, it's very much safety is a main priority for us. So we'll be watching that. We have grandkids out there. Is there any possibility of you folks, when you do this construction, is putting up signs that we have, you know, children at play? Because I live between two windmills, not complaining about the windmills at all, just to make sure that if the grandkids are out riding the horses or we're out riding the horses, we don't have somebody coming down that gravel road 70 miles an hour. I just wondered if you folks put some kind of speed limit signs up for the construction, as well as I talked to you earlier, Paul. But anyway, I just wanted to know that so, you know, at least the grandkids and uh, us on the horses have a chance to get out of the way. So just asking, uh, the, the question was, can we put up signs for speed limits, children at play, things like that? I don't think that we have any problem doing that. So I think the answer is that we would want to check with the county because we need to make sure that they approve any, you know, postings that we would put up um, around the project area. But I don't think that there's any issue with us saying that we can, you know, put up signs as, as requested. You know, we wouldn't want to just go papering all over the neighborhood. But to the extent people have the specific request, please let us know and we can work with you to get signs put up. Thank you for your questions. Thanks, Al. More questions, ma'am. Catherine Geither. The question I have is with the longer blades, how much further does that ice throw than it did with the blades we have now? Because I, I think someplace I read it was uh, the blades size that we have can throw up to about 1,700 feet and I've had ice in my yard from it um, a couple of years ago and I just wondered with the longer blade how much further is that then going to travel? So I don't have an exact answer to your, the question was how much longer is the potential uh, ice throw from the repowered turbines relative to the current turbines. I don't have an answer for you offhand, I will get back to you on that. But what I will reiterate is that um, these turbines will uh, have a um, monitoring system that will uh, monitor the conditions that, uh, that ice buildup could happen in and have automatic safety features in place to make sure that in those types of conditions 
that those uh, blades will be shut down such that the, that ice throw uh, wouldn't happen. So we view that as a very, very low risk possibility, but I will uh, commit to getting an answer for you in the case that something were to happen to the system and uh, an event occurred. Okay, this is a more generic question because when everybody has a project, everybody looks at the money. Who pays for the repowered, there's actually a Fed tax you've talked about, there's investors, but who else, and I'm going to give you the other side of it, who will benefit from the project? And I want you to be specific about the grid. Okay, so the question was who pays for the repowering and who benefits from the repowering. So on the payment side, so this will be a 100% privately funded um, construction uh, funding. So what will happen is that the current owner of the project, uh, Everpower Wind Holdings, will fund the construction on the uh, what we call construction equity, and we will get a private bank to uh, provide construction debt. Uh, the same way that you, you know, have construction debt to build anything else. And so at the end of uh, the construction uh, period, when we hit commercial operation, we will have uh, the construction loan repaid, and it will be then 100% equity funded uh, for the life of the project. Now, the equity and wind projects uh, that utilize the production tax credit, which I'll get into in a moment, um, usually is, is broken up into uh, two different uh, investors in the project. There will be one investor that specializes in taking advantage of the production tax credit, uh, essentially the attributes on the tax side, and the other owner will take more uh, of the kind of uh, um, remaining interest of the project, which is usually just the, the cash flow generated by the project over time. So what you'll see is that over, over uh, the course of the equity period or the uh, operational period, there'll be two different investors in the project. Uh, at least one will be more of a what we call a tax equity investor, and another investor will be a, uh, just the, the, the other side of the equity uh, that isn't taking the tax attributes. Uh, those parties have not been identified. Those will be identified during the financing process here in the next few months. But that's generally how uh, project financing in the wind space works. Uh, the production tax credit is a 10-year tax credit offered by the federal government for um, wind energy projects uh, that is uh, currently at what we call you know 100 percent of, of historical and it will start stepping down in 2021 so this project will be eligible for the full production tax credit um, in terms of who benefits from this project i think there there are a lot of answers to that question number one is that the renewable energy from uh, produced by this project will increase increase by about 30 percent so in terms of uh, energy for the grid, for the growing load uh, of the state of Illinois and for all of uh, the PJM market footprint, um, all the rate payers and folks that are interested in getting clean renewable energy are gonna benefit. More specifically to uh, the local community, as mentioned, we're gonna be putting in together a community benefits fund. Uh, we've already made a couple of commitments that we've mentioned and we will be continuing to make more commitments on the community benefits side to local organizations, charitable groups, nonprofits. So if you have ideas, again, I'll make this the second pitch for this, uh, for what kind of groups uh, might use some support, please let us know because we'd love to get in touch with them. Um, and then uh, lastly is we're anticipating a uh, property tax base increase uh, for, uh, for the state based on this project um, because what we'll be doing is replacing depreciated equipment with new equipment which will have a, ta a higher taxable value. Um, actually, what, one last thing is, uh, you know, the local economic benefits of, of the project. So, you know, business owners here in, in the village of Ohio will obviously see a lot more traffic in gas stations and restaurants and stores uh, during the course of construction. We'll have over 150 people here helping build the project. So any local businesses, local contractors, and people who uh, would like to work on the project will be looking for uh, local, you know, um, uh, people to work with us uh, during the repower. So there'll be a lot of uh, specific economic benefits to the community during the repower uh, of the project as well. Okay, we heard about the ice flinging. Where my house is, I get flicker thud from mid-November to mid-February. Now these are gonna be taller. Is it gonna be a wider 
going to start sooner and last longer each day? Or, and what would you do about that? So the question was around, will the, the longer blades create more shadow flicker? So uh, the way that we study these projects is that we have a third party uh, evaluate shadow flicker, uh, same as noise and communications for, uh, for the project. And what I can tell you based on the study results is that we didn't see a significant increase in shadow flicker for the new turbines relative to the old ones. Now that doesn't mean that on an individual basis that might not change uh, for, for folks. So there's two things that I can kind of uh, commit to or, or, or even request. Uh, number one is that we will be fully in compliance with all state requirements for shadow flicker in terms of limitations on what we call you know, receptors, which is essentially homes and residences. Uh, for what the state allows in terms of how much shadow flicker is, is allowed by Winton Project. So we will be fully in compliance with, with all state requirements. And the other thing is that if we do have individual issues that come up or um, you know, concerns after this project is rebuilt, you know, shadow flicker is one of those things that we can study it, but it's, it's difficult to kind of make specific references because it's just, um, it's one of those things that's it's just a bit difficult. So we will have the, the full study as part of our uh, permitting process with uh, both Lee and Bureau County. We recommend that people take a look at that and, and look at the specifics. But um, if there are issues or concerns, please let us know and we can take a little bit more of a specific look at, at your home, for example, and try to see if we can answer your question more specifically. It's, it's a little bit hard to, to talk about uh, at the macro level. We have to get more, a bit more into the weeds for individuals uh, to handle that. Thank you for the question. Here you go, Al. Is there a projected lifespan of these new turbines? And the original turbines, which are being replaced uh, after 10 years, was that expected to last longer than 10 years? All right, so the question was, uh, what was the expected life of the, uh, the current turbines and what is the expected life of, of the new turbines? So uh, now the, the, the current turbines uh, definitely had an uh, expected longer life of, of 10 years and they absolutely will, will last you know, the 20 to 25 years uh, that probably were expected back when they were, were built. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with the, the current technology that, that's built. Uh, what's happened over the last 10 years is much like a cell phone, you know, the technology has improved so quickly and so rapidly and the costs have dropped so quickly, much more than anyone I think anticipated, even, you know, 10, five years ago, that it's allowed for repowerings uh, a little bit earlier in the, in the process to make sense. So I think 10 years ago, if you would have asked someone, you know, will this project ever be repowered? The answer is, well, yeah, maybe, you know, that wouldn't surprise me if, if that happened over time. I think what has surprised people is how quickly the technology has advanced and how quickly the costs have dropped to allow this repowering to make sense today instead of maybe 10 years from now. So um, to answer the question, I think originally I'm sure that these turbines were expected to last 20 to 25 years, which they would if they were remained in place. Uh, the uh, new turbines that we uh, are anticipating for the repower would have the same expected life of 20 to 25 years. Well, he was talking and I came up with two more, so you're in trouble now. All right, this one is specifically rain, ice, tornadoes versus the wind turbines. We all know the world's weather will change. They are telling us it's gonna be nastier, more extreme on temperatures, lots of rain. What if we went out there and you had four feet of water and it wasn't going anywhere? We're in a very flat zone. These affect things. They start to get weakened by the soils or whatever. So some of these things are more extreme in today's world than they were 10 years ago. And this is what I'm concerned about. When they fall, they fall. Tell me, what a, do you have any research or anything known about the turbines in the new version about the weather? So the question was about um, the weather and um, the new turbine technology that we're installing. So um, on the foundations, you know, we look at the existing foundations and do analysis on them. So it's currently taking place right now. And uh, you know, we're going out and doing piezometer testing, which is actually checking the, uh, um, the groundwater levels. 
uh, to determine um, how the design of that foundation is uh, is performing. So um, we are doing that type of analysis and, and, and uh, engineering um, on these new turbines that are going to be placed on these on these foundations. So um, you know, when it comes to the turbines themselves, um, you know, they have a design as well for you know, hurricane-like winds and and uh, different other um, elements of, um, of nature um, in, in their engineering. So, um, I mean, I don't know if you want to bring it back. You know, I, I think it's a great question, and unfortunately, it's like any of our homes or otherwise, we can't predict the future. All we can do is prepare the best that we can. And so, as Paul mentioned, you know, we're, we are doing all the design engineering that we can to ensure that the foundations are proper, that the groundwater has been tested. We're having two different engineering firms bless the foundation designs before this will be redone so that we can make sure that everything's being done properly. We'll be sharing that with the counties to make sure that they agree with our, our calculations. So, um, it will be, you know, ensuring the project, of course, uh, for anything that might happen. So. Um, uh, operational, operationally, right, we'll, we'll be monitoring this 24-7, we'll be evaluating the weather patterns and trying to do anything that we can with the actual operation to help mitigate any circumstances that might arise from, um, you know, hazardous weather events. So we'll do the best that we can to prepare uh, and to manage any situation that occurs and, you know, properly ensure uh, for anything that, that might happen afterwards. But unfortunately, it's one of those things that, you know, we, we can't predict the future. Paula mentioned a question that's come up a number of times that we have heard, and, and that is how are we going to notify landowners whenever construction's about to begin? Generally, before, when construction's about to begin, we will start out with a letter that will go to all the landowners, and to the extent that we have um, you have tenant farmers, if you're not actually on your property and there's tenant farmers that you'd like to have notified as well, please provide us with that contact information and we'll send a notice letter out to whomever wants to be notified that construction's about to start. So there will be a formal letter notifying. And then once there's people typically on the ground, um, Paul, what kind of notification do you do? Door hangers or anything like that? There'll be a public out, you know, outreach where um, you know, the contractor in general is going to go out and, and try to do a local, local hire, um, and there'll be communications with the local public, and also we'll have that single point of contact on our side as well that, that will um, we'll want to reach out and get information so we know who we're talking to and who, we're, who we need to give information to and any scheduling updates. So that'll be continuous, but uh, mostly you're going to know when construction is starting when those type of um, outreaches start to take place. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Linda? All right, uh, this is more of a general one, but I want to hear specifics in it when you figure out the question. I hit you one earlier, where does the equipment actually come from? Who's gonna build them? And who's gonna trans them to here? Things like that, you have to explain that. Um, we have training at IBCC for the original GE stuff, or who's gonna do the training at IBCC for the new ones? Um, and the, there was one more. Well, let's start with those two. <laughs> so on the, uh, uh, the manufacturing of the turbine equipment, so uh, we have not made any final selections. You know, GE as a company kind of maintains uh, different manufacturing operations across the world, and we have not made that final selection yet. So the answer is we don't know where these specific will come from. But GE does have manufacturing operations here in the US, uh, specific to the, the towers, actually. Um, manufactured here, so they might be uh, US based, or else they might be um, international, of which most of their um, manufacturing is in Europe. And then on the IBCC question, I'm, I'm not sure that we can answer that right now, so I will commit to getting back to you on that, if I can get your contact info after we, after we finish up. Come on up. Okay, 
Okay, here's the tougher one. Who has the new turbines now up and running in the state of Illinois? The new turbines, anywhere else in the state of Illinois exist and running? So the question was, are these, uh, the, the turbines that we're talking about repowering with up and running in the state of Illinois? Again, I, I'll have to find out. But what I can tell you is that G, the GE, what they call 2.X platform, because it originally was a 2.0 turbine, and now it's a 2.3, 2.5, and even, I think, a 2.7 they're even making now, is one of the most um, built and manufactured turbines in the world. It, uh, in terms of just market share, it is one of the highest grossing market share turbines um, from GE and from the top three tier, top three turbine manufacturers, which is essentially Siemens, Vestas, and GE. So this is a proven technology. Uh, it is deployed around the world. And again, I can follow up specific to Illinois if you'd like to know how many megawatts of GE turbines are placed here in the state. Additional questions? going once. Uh, we're going to stick around and we'll be here to continue to answer your questions, to give out our contact information to make sure that if something comes to you in five minutes, in five days, no matter what it is, that we're able to, to get that answer to you. Um, we have a, a lot of pizza left back there, so don't be shy about taking some with you. It keeps well in the refrigerator, I believe. I'm going to hand it back to Kevin. Hey, I'll just end by saying thank you again for coming out. We know that it's a cold winter night, so we really appreciate it. And um, thank you for the great questions, both uh, individually and here as a group. As Chris mentioned, we're going to be sticking around until the last uh, folks take off. So please come up uh, afterwards if you didn't have a question that, was in, uh, that you wanted to ask in front of everyone. And as mentioned before, if there are specific uh, issues, specific kind of to your home or neighborhood, please uh, let us know and we can schedule one-on-one -on -one time to come visit with you, whether it's myself or, or Paula or, or Paul. We'll get the right person to you to answer any specific questions you have. So again, thank you very much for the time uh, and the warm welcome. And please take a piece or a box of pizza on your way out. Have a good night. <laughs>